HC has gained much, much importance in today's diagnosis. Initially, we used to believe uh, basically uh, mainly on the histopathology, but now it has come up as a good adjunct in support of histopathology. And so today, for the benefit of our young pathologists and our PG students, Dr. Navani, renowned uh, pathologist, mainly doing the IHC and bringing a revolution in the IHC in a country, and he's there. And his topic is perspectives in immunohistochemistry, assessment, application, and diagnosis. Why is it all so important? So again, this is very important topic. And I think it will benefit all the participants who are joined today's webinar. So without taking much time, now I hand over to Professor Harsh Mohan. Needs no introduction, he's today's moderator. His books are so popular. He is a past president of our IAPM, academically so sound, and uh, everybody knows him. I believe none of our PGs or young pathologists need introduction of our today's moderator. So, uh, Dr. Harsh Mohan, please start the session. Thank you, uh, Dr. Basla. Uh, it's indeed an honor to be associated with this uh, session where we have an eminent speaker, uh, Dr. Sanjay Navani. Uh, Dr. Sanjay Navani has been a keynote speaker for many of our uh, academic programs uh, over the last uh, about 15, 20 years I've been seeing. And you've been very regularly associated with our association uh, in various uh, activities. Uh, Dr. Sanjay Nimani is uh, an MD from prestigious Kasturba Medical College. Uh, and uh, after his post session, he's been associated with uh, the prestigious uh, Candy Hospital in Mumbai as a consultant for a good 15 years uh, before uh, he moved on to have another assignment on uh, a director of the research in uh, proteins in India, where he was developing the research uh, uh, activities in protein atlas in India for antibodies. Uh, simultaneously, he ventured into his own laboratory on surgical pathology and immunohistochemistry in 2003, which he's been heading and developing and has developed uh, many newer antibodies. He has experience of over 200 antibodies and over 2000 in research. So he brings uh, to this uh, forum a rich experience of uh, diagnostic uh, pathology and role of uh, the IHC in diagnostics and in research as well. Uh, as we all understand, immunohistochemistry, uh, which has brought in what we have been calling as a brown revolution in the last about five decades, has become integral component of our diagnostic pathology. And not only diagnostic, it has also got applications in uh, prognosis and uh, predictive pathology as well. But uh, it's important to be careful not to interpret any brown color as positive for immunohistochemistry. And that's what far we have the expert here. Uh, what is positive to assess and how to choose a panel on the basis of your morphologic evaluation of the H and E stain slides, and then how to apply it in diagnosis or prognosis or prediction, and what does this IHC hold in future uh, as regards the semi-quantitation or quantitation or other applications. So we have the expert, I won't take much of uh, the uh, topic and um, I hand over the proceedings to the speaker for today on perspectives in immunohistochemistry, its uh, role in diagnosis, in assessment, uh, Dr. Sanjay Navani. Thank you, Dr. Hashman, for that very, very nice and flattering introduction. Uh, if I may know how I can share my screen. All right, I have it now. So uh, I'm hopeful that everybody is able to see what's yes, on yes. the screen now. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, okay. we can see that. 
Thank you. Thank you for that positive comment. And uh, before you proceed further, uh, yes, can you raise the volume, please? Uh, sure. Yeah, that's better now. Is it better? Is it better? Even now? you oh, said oh, sure, oh, it was better. Okay, and now too, right? Yeah, this is good. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, um, uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming to listen to me this evening at 7 p.m. It's the weekend. So I realize that you have other more real, relaxing things to do, but you've chosen to spend your time listening to me here. Uh, today's session is a bit of a laid back session. I'm going to try and assess overall concepts more than I'm going to try and get into very specific events. I do have a nice collection of a few cases, which I'm sure will, will yeah. have your interest. But what I'm trying most to impart, especially to the younger generation, is some of the, some of the important lessons that yeah. I picked up during this time. And it's my hope that maybe some of this, these will help you in your career when you do immunohistochemistry. Uh, as Dr. Harsh Mohan very categorically and very correctly said a few minutes ago, the microscopic evaluation of HND remains the gold standard, not only for the cancer diagnosis, but also for any diagnosis. Despite the critics of surgical pathology, we know that we currently use only HND to form the basis for our diagnosis. The tool of IHC is a super added layer that gives us more information. And I'll caution you a little to pay close attention to what I'm saying. Immunohistochemistry provides only information. It's you who are making the diagnosis. So whatever information you have, it's very important that you use it carefully. Before getting into the aspects of immunohistochemistry proper, it's important to understand that immunohistochemistry rests on two very critical pillars. The pathologist, of course, who's going to take that information and put it together and come out with a diagnosis or a prognosis. But very important, and I cannot emphasize how important enough, but I hope to tell you in the next few minutes, the technician, the person who will be doing the immunostates. Now, until very recently, India did not have a set of technicians that was separately trained. There are very few specialized technicians in immunohistochemistry in India. And the, the few that are there need to be guided by the pathologist who they work with. It's an important area of responsibility. And that's where I want to get into my first story of what we learned about the importance <coughs> of technical detail when we first started doing IHC. Let me illustrate this by an example. This was one of the largest tumors written on breast cancer from India several years ago. It was almost 800 cases and it divided breast cancers into these four following types. You'll note that almost 50% of the cases were ER and PR negative. And this was in stark contrast to what was seen in the Western population. This raised a question about what the problem was. The Indians insisted, and I was one of them, that there was no problem and that we were dealing with a biologically different form of cancer that had a high number of ER negative cases. But because this was not seen anywhere in the world, naturally there were several questions raised. The problem started and we knew that there was a big problem when slides that were stained for estrogen receptor 
on one staining run looked like this and on another staining run looked like that. There, it, it didn't require a lot of intelligence to realize that there was something wrong in the technical aspects of the stainings. The problem finally was localized to the antigen retrieval system at that time, which was, as most of you may recall. Uh, hello. Good evening, Sarita. Hello. Ah, hello. Hello. Is there somebody? Could, could you turn off your mics, please, ma'am? All right. Thank you. Shall I continue? Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, the, the antigen retrieval solution at that time, you might recall, was a very popular solution called Citra. We made it in-house. This was, this, this was the, the solution that was prescribed in all journals. The reason that the Indians decided to make it in our own labs is that we didn't have enough money or we preferred to save the money from buying the antigen retrieval solution directly from the manufacturer. When we changed that Citra solution from one millimolar from 10 millimolar, as I showed you on the previous slide, to 1 millimolar, the staining of estrogen receptor magically improved. Every slide that we stained showed normal estrogen receptor positivity in all normal lobules. Not only did it show positivity, we were also able to see strong ER, weak ER, and intermediate ER confirming that our staining intensities were being detected all right. Now, there was a big lesson to be learned in all of this. The big problem in immunohistochemistry, 90% of the problem is in false negative testing. We have to be very careful that the staining process is good. The technicians, particularly if you are a younger pathologist, you don't belong to a tertiary care institute, uh, a larger institute, you're trying to do immunohistochemistry on your own, you must be very careful because your interpretation of these tests, particularly the hormonal tests, are going to have a great impact on the treatment and the prognosis of the patient. Now, fortunately for us, most antibodies are not like estrogen receptor. Unfortunately for us, estrogen receptor was, is one of those antibodies which gets blocked by a higher concentration of citra. Most other antibodies don't. And that's why it's critical for us to understand the technical aspects. Before we leave the subject of hormone receptors, I'd like to show you this slide which shows a few nuclei that have stained. And you might think, and you might think very correctly so, that they are weakly stained. And before you decide that this is weakly stained estrogen receptor positivity, I want to zoom out a little and show you what else has stained. So you'll see that in addition to these nuclei, there are some fibroblasts, mesenchymal cells, blood vessels that have also picked up. And now we are not sure what kind of stain this is. I told you it is an estrogen receptor, but I misled you. It's in fact a vimentin stain. But if it is a vimentin stain, then what are these lightly stained nuclei doing there? And where did they come from? This problem has plagued us for a very long time. This is a slide that you might say very simply hasn't been washed properly. If you wash it once more with the buffer, these stains will or might disappear. Sometimes due to the spurious paraffins that are used in our country, these stains do not disappear. It's very important to make sure that the paraffin that you use in your laboratory actually melts at the temperature 
that it's supposed to melt at. However, the good news is that if you increase the duration of these sections in alcohol and xylene, these disappear and you'll get a better state. So, don't forget about the 10% false positives. The clue to this will be when nuclear stains show up in slides that have been stained with cytoplasmic stains or membrane stains. So if you are doing a HER2 and you get a nuclear stain, then you know what the problem is. Let's get on to our first case. It was a 42-year-old female and she had some granularity in the alveolar mucosa that was biopsy. The x-ray was taken because it was looked at by a neural pathologist. The underlying bone was normal. And that's what the slide showed. The section on the left shows some kind of tumor that shows glandular differentiation. And the slide on the right-hand side shows a, a higher power view that confirms that this is a malignant tumor. And because of the glandular differentiation, a malignant adenocarcinoma that looks that it's probably metastatic. So I started doing the regular IHC, which is to first do a CK7 and to do a CK20. I had anticipated it would be CK7 positive and CK20 negative. It was CK7 positive. So I proceeded with TTF1 and Napsin A, which we know are hallmark markers when they come together TTF1 and Napsin A, and particularly in combination with CK7, then most pathologists know that you're supposed to consider a diagnosis of lung carcinoma, lung adenocarcinoma. And that's what I said, which is when the question arose. The moment the report was received by the referring pathologist, he called me back. And he said that, uh, sir, the patient has no history of such a lesion. The clinician doesn't suspect it. What do you suggest I do? I very confidently told him, you should get a CT or an MR done of the chest. And he said, okay, I will pass on that information and come back to you. He came back to me a couple of days later and he said that we got the CT done. There was nothing in the chest but there is a mass in the gallbladder. That's when I went back to the case and did two more markers, a CDX2 and a PAX8. I had expected that coming out of the GIT would show me a CDX2 positivity. The reason was, and I wasn't aware of that when I handed out my original diagnosis was that the gastrointestinal tract shows a subset of cancers that stain positive for CK7, TTF1, and Napsin A. But the important thing, which I didn't do at that time, was to include CDX2 in the panel. If CDX2 had been included, then perhaps it would have picked up in the nuclei and I could have got a clue. So if you suspect a lung adenocarcinoma, you are getting Napsin A and TTF1 and CK7 positivity, please do include a CDX2 in your panel. Part of the reason for this overlap is that there are two very well-known antibodies for TTF1, which are currently used by most people. One is more sensitive than the other. So out of 100 cases, one antibody will detect 70 adenocarcinomas in the lung. The other will detect only 50. So everybody tends to use the antibody which detects 70 adenocarcinomas just as me. That's the antibody I use. But there is a caveat. That antibody also picks up gastrointestinal carcinomas. So be careful. What was the lesson I learned from this? 
I wasn't wrong when I said TTF1, CK7, Napsin A positivity means that it is lung adenocarcinoma. But I was slow. The IHC world had moved forward. They were now no longer saying that, even though that was true. I hadn't kept myself updated. Make sure you're updated and then be prepared that after that you may still be wrong. You remember I showed you that slide of CDX2? I went back, I did the CDX2. It was negative, but it was still a gallbladder carcinoma. Let me go on quickly to the next case. It was a 47 year old male who had no complaint except a persistently enlarged axillary node for six months. He had been empirically given antibiotics. He was not responding. He had no other lesion. He had no other complaints. They had tried an FNAC. The FNAC had failed. So they excised the node. And that's what I saw. If you see the lower powers, both the picture at the top, the sinuses were sinusoids were distended with these pinkish marks of cells. These masses at higher power, they had some intermingling of lymphocytes. The cells by themselves feel very, very bland. And uh, uh, in fact, no, no remarkably dangerous features. I proceeded with the IHC. Surprisingly, let me just go back for a minute. When I, when, I, when I looked at the higher power in these slides, I couldn't help noticing that they were attempting to bridge. Many of them were separate. Some of them were attempting to bridge. And in some places I thought there was a gland or almost like a lumen being created. Although I had to admit that it didn't look like a classical adenocarcinoma. I wasn't sure whether I would get positivity for epithelial markers. And I have to admit that I was a little surprised when I did. And that too, with such strong stains, the pancytokeratin was positive, the CK7 was positive, the CK5 and 6 surprisingly was positive. CK5 and 6 is not a marker that you see with such widespread expression in every tumor. There are just a handful of them that produce it. And the most common amongst those is a squamous carcinoma. So naturally I thought that even though this doesn't look like a squamous carcinoma, I should do a P40, which is a nuclear stain. And as expected, the P40 came negative. I then proceeded with a panel for the upper part, upper, uh, 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 carcinomas, the carcinomas that you see above the diaphragm. So for the lung, for the bowel, a PAX-8 just in case, and they were all negative. It was then that I decided to try something as a probe, and I was very happy to see the result. And this marker was calretinin. I thought, and I tried to think about the number of cases, the number of tumors that would show positivity, widespread positivity for CK5 and 6. One is squamous epithelium. We see it normally also in the urothelium, although in the urothelium, it's not so widespread. The other tumor where it's reasonably consistently positive is a mesothelioma. And the calretinins seem to support that. So I did some more markers for mesothelioma, a D240, which was positive, and a WT1, and they were all positive. But when I got back to the referring pathologist, he says, yes, but there is no such complaint in the patient. We've done an X-ray, we've done a CT, and there's nothing in the chest. They later looked at the abdomen, and he had a mask there. He also had a minimal ascites. So sometimes when histories are not exactly forthcoming, we have to be alert about what we are seeing on the slides and the choice of markers. 
if you are practicing in 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 a smaller setup i would strongly recommend cal retinin and d240 as the first line markers and if you get ck5 and 6 positive you can be almost certain it's a mesothelioma these markers older markers are far more sensitive and specific when used in combination rather than the newer ones like hbme and mesothelioma Okay, just give me a minute. All right, so that was my diagnosis: metastatic mesothelioma. Now, the lesson that I got from this was that unusual tumors do occur at unusual locations. Don't be afraid to include a diagnosis. in your dd it's better you include it and exclude it later rather than not include it at all it doesn't matter if at that moment at time it sounds ridiculous or sounds stupid it doesn't really matter as long as you consider it and rule it out try and correlate your ihcs if the ck5 and 6 is staining but the p40 is not staining it's not a squamous carcinoma and you can get rid of that from your dd very easily all right let me move on to my third case this was a 37 year old female who had a soft tissue swelling over the back and the case was of course referred for an ihc workup and diagnosis there was no doubt on low par examination that it was a soft tissue sarcoma it looked like a spindle cell sarcoma and the high par view confirmed that the cells were very uniform very spindle shape uniform nuclei obviously lot of mitotic activity so definitely looked like a malignant tumor the problem was in its classification so i started off with the panel that i normally prefer to start off with these kind of tumors i start off usually with a smooth muscle actin because that's a sensitive marker it detects well smooth muscle and that gives some indication of whether it's myofibroblastic or leiomyosarcomatous s100 is important because of the neural differentiation you might notice that i have added sox 10 there and the reason for that is that sox 10 in recent years has turned out to be a very reliable nuclear marker for neural differentiation a word of caution about s100 protein it's not the easiest of antibodies to work with when you look at the tissue surrounding your tumor if you've got some normal nerve in it the nerve will gleam beautifully and you'll feel very happy looking at it and you'll tell yourself this is so wonderful this stain is working so beautifully and i can't blame you for that almost every lab that uses s100 immuno stain will stain their nerves beautifully the problem is in staining the tumor with s100 because the concentrations of s100 in different tumors are at a far lower level then normal nerves make sure the concentration of your s100 is right and if you are getting a tumor where you've tried an s100 and it's coming negative and you think it should not be negative don't give up you may be right increase the concentration and try it again you may be surprised to come back to the To, to the first picture i also added calponin i add that sometimes just to know it's not as smooth muscle actin is not a specific marker calponin is even less so but it is a very sensitive marker and seen in smooth muscles so i just like to use that sometimes to know where i stand is there any calponin anywhere 
is this really differentiating towards smooth muscle somewhat is does it belong to the myofibroblastic category so that's the kind of information that i'm looking for the tle one i'm sure you don't need me to tell you is included as a screening marker for synovial sarcoma it's not a diagnostic marker although the large majority of synovial sarcomas will show it the kind of positivity that this slide shows is good it's not just mild but every nucleus has in picked up if every nucleus picks it up or 95% of the nuclei pick it up in a nice dark stain yeah okay that's a synovial sarc probably a synovial sarcoma but the problem is that when you do immuno stains the stains that you do also compel you to do other stains now while sam reasonably sure on this slide that this is not going to turn out to be a synovial sarcoma i can't let it go without doing an ema without doing a pan cytokeratin ck7 ck19 so that's the catch and that's why we need to think very carefully before we go into the markers because a lot of markers can give you a lot of information it should be information that you can use it shouldn't just make you spend more money and give you nothing in return so this was negative so this was obviously not a synovial sarcoma i then used another marker that i normally use as a part of my screening panels and i almost missed this cluster of four five or six cells that was present in one corner probably i had seen the slide too hurriedly the first time and when i went back the next morning and i looked at it again there it was there and this marker i'm sure many of you would have guessed it was desmin now the moment desmin comes positive it opens up another avenue it forces you to do many other markers desmin by itself particularly in this manner focal positivity in few cells is not particularly diagnostic if this was a nice spindle cell tumor eosinophilic cells somebody telling you this is a tumor from the uterine corpus and desmin in every cell of course you don't need any other marker that's a leiomyosarcoma but this you could see it in many tumors and so i did the next marker which showed me a similar picture and this marker was myogenin now it was getting interesting desmin and myogenin both markers for muscle myogenin far more specific than desmin and therefore i was left with no choice but to do the third marker which showed a similar picture and that was myod1 the most specific marker for muscle differentiation so i finally called that a spindle cell rhabdomyosarcoma now this slide or this case it raises the question i didn't have spindle cell rhabdomyosarcoma in my original list of dds my original list of dds was is this neural is this smooth muscle is this synovial sarcoma i didn't put spindle cell rhabdomyosarcoma in my original list of dds because it's not such a common diagnosis but what saved me was that i included desmin in that panel you have to be careful about putting a lot of things into your dd if it's not in your dd then it's definitely not in your final diagnosis the other question which i know that many of the young students the young post graduates the young practitioners find very frustrating is the question of assessment of ihc markers are sir ye 6 5 6 cells stain ho rahe hain aur aap bol rahe ho conclusive hai dusre slide mein you say that cytokeratin is very focal and light and that is not a carcinoma that's an epithelioid sarcoma now this is the problem this is the problem with ihc some markers 
are very specific. When you get this group of markers, Desmin, Myogenin, MyoD1, focal positivity, spindle cell lesion, not classic for anything else, it is specific enough to make that diagnosis. But please remember, that's not necessarily true for pancytokeratin or vimentin or for that example, TLE1, as we saw in this case. Okay, let's leave these cases aside and let me try to give you a perspective about antibodies. It's my personal belief, and I don't mean this as a, as a, as a critical comment, but I believe that we as a group, as a group of pathologists, as a group of surgical pathologists, do not pay enough attention to the antibodies that we use. I mean, real attention. Let's take this for example. I chose this to be a research antibody for a specific reason. The name of this antibody is ADAM2. It's supposed to be seen only in spermatids. The reason for that is that it's a subunit of fertilin, which is a, pro which is a protein that is found only in spermatids. And the three pictures that you see on top, in the top row, are pictures of seminiferous tubules that have been stained with three different antibodies. The one, the two antibodies on the, the center antibody and the antibody on the right, H, labeled HPA, were produced under the Human Protein Atlas program and antibodies that we evaluated. And the one on the left was used, uh, was a commercial antibody. And as you can see, they have all stained some cells in the seminiferous tubules selectively. However, when you look at the lower pictures, the same three antibodies, those are pictures of the pancreas. The first antibody shows some weak staining in the islets of Langerhans. The central antibody is negative, as it should be. And the last one shows positive staining both in the Langerhans islets as well as in the exocrine pancreas. So whatever it's doing in the test is, is doing something else in the pancreas. Now, my question to you is, do you know what your antibodies are doing? Or do you believe that the label is telling you everything? When the label says CK7, do you believe it is CK7? Totally, completely, it will stain. That means it is CK7. For example, have you seen a stain for KI67, which stains the nucleus, and looked at the blood vessel wall and find out how it stains that? That is a characteristic sign of the MIB1 clone. And therefore, I don't know why this is not. Just give me a minute. Okay, so we come to the lesson that we learned from this slide. Be sure you know the antibody you're using and what it's doing. The clone that you're using is very important. Same antibody, estrogen receptor, different clone will do different things. The basic job it will do, it may tell you, estrogen receptor is positive. But some will be more sensitive, some will be less sensitive, some will pick up something else. And please be very sure that you understand whether you're using antibodies for in vitro diagnostic use or for research use only. Let's get on to the final example that I have for today. A 64 year old female with complaints of generalized bone pain. The peripheral blood smear showed pancytopenia and the PET scan showed a diffuse uptake in several bones. And naturally with this picture, she underwent a bone marrow biopsy. This is what the biopsy showed. Small round cells replacing a lot of other cells in the bone marrow. At first sight, I thought that these cells look very much for like lymphocytes, except that they seem to have a little more cytoplasm 
than I normally expect. In some places, it wasn't so much, but then in some other places, it was much more. Say, for example, here and much less there. And I proceeded with the first panel just to decide what these cells were. My first guess was that these were lymphoid cells and I had to rule that out first. So I did a general CD45 marker. I did a myeloperoxidase. I did a glycoporin, which is an RBC marker and a CD61, which is a marker for megakaryocytes. And everything was negative. I then thought that these cells with larger cytoplasm will probably represent hairy cell leukemia. So I did two markers for that. I did a cyclin D1 and I did an annexin A1, but no luck, they were both negative. I then thought that I have missed out something. You know, there are many lymphoid lesions which don't necessarily show you CD45 positivity. You need to be a little aggressive with those and follow up and see whether any of the uh, lineage specific markers come specific. So I did all these other stains, not at the same time, but over a period of time in the hope that I would finally find some lead into what kind of lymphoid lesion this was. So the B cell markers, the T cell markers, the plasma cytoid T cell markers, everything was negative. I then really thought that perhaps these are not lymphoid cells. I made an error. They are small round cells. I haven't been smart enough. They are probably Langerhans cells. That fits the history well. Multiple bone involvement, uh, leukopenia. It's okay, I'll do the Langerhans cell markers and I don't want to take a chance. I'll do all the markers that I normally do for Langerhans cells. And they were all negative. I finally told myself, and by this time, it was getting quite frustrating. I had no leads. No leads means zero. Normally, when you do IHC, something shines somewhere. It's not always what you expect, but it gives you an idea. It helps you to think in a different direction. And out of desperation, I said, yeah, maybe there's a fixation aspect. You know, these pathologists like me, they don't fix properly. So I'm going to do all the monocytoid B cell markers because with so much voluminous cytoplasm, it could be a monocytoid B cell, even though it's negative for CD20. But as you can see, that was wishful thinking. I finally said, okay, now this is enough. These are not lymphoid cells. I'm sure about that now. Maybe this is some kind of systemic mastocytosis. Let's do markers for that. So CD117, mast cell tryptase, also negative. By this time, I was out of ideas. I was also out of antibodies. I had no more antibodies to play with. And my technician walked in and told me, Sir, Bavi's stain ho gaye hai. Aapko malum hai na? And I said, yes, huh? malum hai mujhe. Then I started wondering, whether the tissues hadn't been fixed properly. But whether the tissues had not been decalcified properly, whether too strong an acid had been used and killed all my markers. Was there a problem in the antigen retrieval? And because I had no further ideas, I finally decided to call the referring pathologist. And that was really what should I have, I have done in the first place. So while talking to him, he said, Haan, sir ji, ye, you know, flow wale bhi yehi baat bol rahe hai, ke unko bhi koi marker nahi mil rahe. I was surprised to hear that because many times I've got a hint from flow. Flow tells me ye positive hai, ye negative hai. I can correlate. It's not beneath our dignity to speak to our colleagues and other lines of investigation when we are frustrated with something. They may give us an important lead. So I got the name of the person who was doing the flow and I called the lady, a very nice lady, 
from CMC Ludhiana, I'm sorry, I don't recollect the name, and spoke to her and she confirmed it. She said, yes, we are not able to get the cells to express anything. That confirmed one thing. I wasn't alone in my agony. There were others agonizing about this case. And therefore, everything that I had done could not be entirely wrong. So whilst talking to her, she let slip something that I latched on. And she said, yeah, this was, you know, a bit funny. And this was a marker which came dim on our flow. And I just thought I'll mention it to you. And I said, thank you. I'm glad you did. And I said, Itne marker ho gaye. let's do one more. And I did that marker. And that's the slide of that marker. And every cell was positive to my amazement because the marker was Desmond. Desmond in this type of cell in the bone marrow. And as I told you, the problem with Desmond is it's a good foot soldier. It goes in first, but the moment it gives you a possibility, you have to do myogenin and you have to do myoD1. But it didn't disappoint here either. So here I was looking at a small round cell in the bone marrow, which was positive for Desmond, myogenin and myoD1. And much more widely than the spindle cell rhabdomyosarcoma I showed you some time ago. I thought I had no choice. So I said, this is a rhabdomyosarcoma involving the bone marrow. The referring pathologist called me back and said, sir, with respect, ye rhabdomyosarcoma bone marrow mein kaha se aagaya? Humne iski puri body ki investigation karwai hai. There is no mass anywhere. Finally, the onco oncologist called me and said, yeah, this, you know, Dr. Navani, you're calling this a rhabdomyosarcoma. And this is obviously a, a hematopoietic lesion. And then I went into the literature and found documented cases of rhabdomyosarcoma involving bone marrow in elderly individuals in which no solid soft tissue mass was present. Therefore, when there are similar looking entities in unusual locations, you have to widen your perspective a little bit. And in those situations, it's good if you have more than one marker to support your diagnosis. Now, as I come up towards the last few slides of my lecture, I want to just make a couple of points about those of you young persons out there who do research projects, theses, in which you do many rare antibodies. I talked about one of those, Adam 2, which are far more expensive and where you need to think about the cost. I very much would like to caution you that whilst I appreciate your enthusiasm and I've had the opportunity to talk to many of you over the phone, please be sure about what you're buying. These antibodies are priced at four, five, six times the price that normal antibodies cost. There's much to be said for spending money in the path of science, but I'm not a big proponent of young people spending money that they can ill afford on exotic tests when there are better methodologies available. It's very easy to go to this website, proteinatlas.org. It's a website where you can type in any protein and get access to antibody staining patterns for several thousands of antibodies. We have a total of almost 27,000 antibodies, which characterize 17,000 proteins. So if you're thinking of doing a research work or a paper, at least go and see. It's for free. You don't need to spend any money. All you need is your brain, your laptop and internet connection. And you'll see all the images 
and you can decide what you want to buy. You'll see staining patterns in 50 normal tissues in 20 most common types of cancer. You'll get almost 600 tissue cores that have been stained with the same antibody. And it's with some pride that I tell you that all these images, many millions of them, have all been looked at by your young colleagues from India. The technology that was used was tissue microarrays. I strongly recommend you to seriously think and talk to your guides about using this. It saves money. It's the right thing for a young person to do. You prepare a microarray block. I can help you with that. And then you don't need to spend a lot of money on your antibodies. That's how the blocks are prepared. You take cores from one block, put it into a recipient block, section it, and you can put many tissues on the same slide from different blocks. I'm sure you've heard of this technique. I just want to tell you that it's very much happening. You should consider using it. You can get beautifully stained images if you choose your areas carefully. That's a nice slide that's been put together by somebody in the lab just to show you that if you go onto the protein atlas and you're looking for a specific antibody in a specific tissue, let's take the first line. You're looking for CYP2A6 and you say, please bring up images of this in liver, colon, kidney, testis, lymph node, and cerebral cortex. The top five images will come up and you will know that the liver is positive for it. It can't get any simpler. There are more than 16 million images that we evaluated. More than to approximately 27,000 antibodies. Now, what was the most, there were many papers we wrote. There were many findings we made, but what was the most important finding in our view for diagnostic pathologists? Less than 4% of all these proteins are tissue specific. So if you are looking at a tumor in the ovary and you say this is SAL4 positive, and it 100, 100, 101% means this is a germ cell tumor. Don't be so sure. IHC is very rarely that 100% conclusive on just one antibody. You need to get everything together. It's all got to make sense together. And finally, I come to the penultimate slide of my slide of my lecture. Is there a lesson in this last thing about this antibodies and protein atlas? And that really, like everything in IHC, depends on your perspective. Let me tell you why. The people who did these 16 million images were 26 pathologists. They were all below 30. They had no previous experience in IHC. Not one slide. They didn't do IHC in their institutions. They came to do this job because they wanted to learn IHC. They spent time in the lab after five in the evening to crazy hours at night learning about IHC. They produced an unimaginable amount of work. 16 million images has never been done in the world by any group. It's only we who've done it. And you have every reason to be proud because thousands of people access the Protein Atlas every day and looked at images that have been annotated by Indian pathologists. So if you think that maybe that's a good bit of information, but there's no lesson in it, then I have a question for you. If you are a young individual, if you want to do IHC, there is absolutely no reason that you cannot. 
we did it with nothing we produced the world's biggest database we had no experience in iit i worked out of a small private laboratory not a tertiary care institution if somebody like me can do it and if somebody like those young people can do it i think you should go home and ask yourself particularly if you want to do surgical pathology why you cannot do it and please critically evaluate your answer because with this kind of talent people who can do this kind of work from this country there is absolutely no reason that you cannot thank you very much for your attention thank you dr sanjay it's been wonderful talk very very informative and i enjoyed it so thoroughly your cases were so interesting and uh, so well elucidated it was really a treat uh, i would say thank you and the kind of information you rendered at the end for uh, residents and for all of us actually not residents alone um, how people can access uh, so much of volume of uh, data from uh, you know uh, internet resources Uh, which can be very very useful. Uh, now, before we uh, um, throw this subject open for discussion, uh, may I request the audience to type their questions and queries in Q and A on your toolbar? I don't find any, but meanwhile we'll have uh, some comments of uh, the learned uh, people amongst the panelists. Um, may I ask? Uh, I can see Dr. Bishan Radotra right away there. uh for his comments on the subject are you there vishal i have to unmute myself sorry so i i said that as usual it was treat to listen to sanjay his vast experience and um, uh we are very happy i have uh, a few things uh, which i i could gather the uh, i mean i wanted to ask sanjay his experience uh dr sanjay can i ask you i mean um, uh, as you yourself mentioned that ck56 is a very good antibody yes sir but but in india we are not using it i can remember that this is used to be this is very common uh, antibody say i i worked in uk so i can tell about uk it's very common they they use it why yeah. it is not is it because the vendors are not promoting or is it because of the uh, 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 on the part of the pathologist us that is one the other thing is uh, among your cases i uh, i it was, they were very good but i would also say that uh, the case which you presented uh, uh, the one which was uh, uh, i think radoma sarcoma spindle cell type uh, achieve is probably i think i would have gone the same way uh, sorting out fibrosarcoma and uh, cellular sarcoma and so on but uh, b- you found that there was very focal possibility for desmin which let you to do some to uh, myo d1 and uh, myogen so uh, in your experience vast experience how common is it to see the focal positivity Uh, of these muscle markers because i have uh, whatever case i have seen uh, most of the times we do see not this much this focal but we do see uh, many um, areas showing there may be focal um, patchy positivity but we do see so that is uh, one of the questions about that second part i think you can the other thing which i want to comment is that sanjay is very right you must know what your antibodies are and uh, i give uh, Uh, i give example of uh, say he would second me i give one of the example i get one i get one when we bought one of my colleagues but uh, abcam uh, antibody from this didn't work at all until we i mean we know that it doesn't work it is viral of it it works so there are many vendors in the market who are there to push you you buy this you buy this and then we as usual medical people we are in hurry and uh, just because the uh, antibodies we have to push the procurement thing and there are so many difficulties so we buy whatever we get so but i think it is very important and the second uh, other p- point sanjay i would like to know from you is 
recently i have was working on these pituitary tumors and um, we bought uh, pit one you know this uh, transcription factor for uh, pituitary uh, so pit pit one didn't work at all uh, we bought it from abcam but then we bought it from novo biological and it worked beautifully the same fixation same blocks and so i think uh, if you have uh, some uh, thing to say what i have just raised i would be happy there is there is plenty to discuss about about this topic but i'm i'm sure sanjay could not have gone much beyond this he has so much to say but naturally time is a factor thank you uh, shall i answer that uh, dr yes, sure. please please go on yeah so dr radhotra first of all let me uh, say that as far as buying antibodies from the market is concerned we are all in the same boat the problem is that many of these antibodies are not validated that is that the pathologist cannot see what is the data available on that research antibody secondly the antibodies when they are supplied to the consumer they are not well maintained in the cold chain and people tend to cut corners cold chain is expensive by the time the antibody arrives at your place it's probably not well stored the third thing is and this is just a is just a feeling that i have developed over the years that when you read the website they will tell you buy this antibody it costs only this much and the dilution is 1 in 500 and as the pathologist you have to make your calculation and you have to say theek hai 1 in 500 is very good agar mujhe 1 in 100 bhi mil gaya mm. i'll be able to stain 50 slides theek hai yes. i'll buy this antibody and when the antibody we have found comes to us it works in as low as 1 in 20 or 1 in 5 exactly so the problem is that they always write that in their literature that we cannot guarantee and the dilution has to be determined by your own lab so this is always going to be a problem but there are some companies and abcam is one of them and you will find some of them also on the protein atlas they guarantee yes. that if you follow this retrieval process and use this concentration of antibody then you will get these results which we are displaying otherwise we will take the antibody back so until then it is good because until then the manufacturers agree but unfortunately for a couple of students it has happened they have bought the antibody which sometimes is expensive cost 50000 they return the antibody and the vendor tells them ha wo aapka refund banta hai 50000 ka or the the courier to and fro cost me 18000 so this is the balance 32000 now i think what the pathologist need to do is to tell clearly the person that when you say you are giving me a full refund it means a full refund i am not going to pay the courier cost because your antibody is not working so this is something that we all need to work through and we have to be united in our approach it's difficult getting sanctions for antibodies making the purchases money becoming available and if we are not careful the same thing is happening in the automated machines people will tell you that you will go to them with a complaint that i have this antibody from this company and i have this machine from this person and this antibody is not staining the first answer you will get is you please uh, don't buy this antibody buy from my company i i i'll give you the result so yes. so it's important to educate ourselves i think that's really the bottom line yes good meanwhile yeah. if there are no more uh, the people are coming to comment i would like to respond that you know uh, we being the uh, very large big consumer for these antibodies and uh, if, i'm just saying for the interest of others what sanjay said is exactly right many a times when the antibody doesn't work with us we return it and we do not uh, pay any 
charges uh, this courier charges we take full refund so this is some understanding between us and the vendors right maybe yeah. it uh, it may uh, the deco people are the ones which who, who do not refund fully are there but what we used to do was we would bring the person to our lab on our request they come to the lab they demonstrate us what is the best way to use antibody whether it is abcam uh, now uh, of course uh, the osv has taken over the cell mark and whatever and deco they used to come regularly visit our department and nothing we don't pay anything they tell us use this uh, buffer do this and our technicians they learn so i think if you put your foot down and if you are a good customer for them they will do the job uh, may i may i add to this uh, uh, what about uh, the role of manual versus uh, auto stainer uh, because uh, the critical steps uh, probably do not reproduce the results so well in manual staining versus auto stainer most of the laboratories don't have um, uh, i mean small laboratories don't have um, auto immuno stainers so sanjay what is your comment on that uh, because uh, you you mentioned about uh, antibodies not working so is the experience of it as well sometimes so what do you have got to say on this uh i would say that if you are a small setup and working with just a few antibodies you will do very well with a manual setup provided you take care to see that the procedures are not well followed but well understood the problems arise if you try to do ihc without really being involved at the technical level if you are not involved at the technical level you will have lot of problems both mm. manually and on the machine the machines help because for those persons who words of 50 60 70 80 slides a day there is no other practical way to do it but the machines come with their own problems some antibodies from some companies will not work on machines from some companies and this was a big education for us because we thought that all machines are the same it's like an air conditioner you put on an air conditioner the room who cares whether it is in or voltas or mitsubishi but the automated immuno stainers don't work like that because they have their own setups and their own protocols mm -hmm. and this is well established so if you don't understand that then you will play the the machine seller will always tell you you buy all the antibodies from me i will give you excellent results but if you are happy with that that's very good but if you are a discerning person and you say yes i will buy these 10 antibodies from you because i like your clones but i won't buy these 10 i want to get them from elsewhere then you will have a problem yeah i think yeah and of course you did mention about the role of a technician so i think there is need for a dedicated person who is doing the uh, you know staining in your laboratory with the uh, full concentration and understanding the steps very well yeah Absolutely. you mentioned about qualitative part uh, largely um, do you have anything to say on semi quantitative or grading uh, to the okay. audience okay so i didn't really get into that because i was just trying to a brief comment on it Yeah. for audience yeah so just to give you a whole picture you might recall that i said that only 4% of the proteins are tissue specific this has prompted people to believe that looking for expression of proteins in different organs was probably better done quantitatively rather than qualitatively for example do cancers show a greater quantity of particular proteins because the same proteins are also present in normal tissue this is the first point that i i just like to clarify as as far as qualitative and quantitative is concerned the second issue which is very much on the horizon and already there in many parts of the world catching on in india as well is that in a qualitative or a semi quantitative analysis it's very difficult to arrive at definite cut off points so 
if i have a case of breast cancer that is showing 5% positivity please turn off your microphones those who are not speaking please turn off the microphone please carry on sanjit yeah so all of us grade and quantitate differently what may be 10% to me may be 15% to someone else may be 12% to a third and therefore the question arises that in something as objective as ki67 labeling or estrogen receptor labeling can we automate that count by a scanner and eliminate the need for the pathologist entirely and of course as many people are aware that is currently the practice in yeah. several parts of the world yeah but the, these are the easy antibodies it's easy to teach the computer to learn to gather data on this kind of stain but cytoplasmic stains membranous stains they are much more difficult and it is hoped that over maybe the next decade or two the computer will have more of an input in trying to understand this scanning of the slides and digital pathology for ihc as well yeah that's that's true oh uh, what about the future in um, rnd technology i'm sorry i didn't get that is there any future of ihc in uh, rna or micro rna techniques oh yes rna that's a very relevant question dr harshmohan and if i could just take a minute to to uh, elaborate to the audience about the significance of uh, dr dr mohan has raised a relevant question what about the rna and how does it relate to antibody May I request uh, the people in audience to please mute your microphone. The audience is requested to mute their microphone, please. Sanjay, carry on, please. Yeah. So, the the uh, the RNA is examined in a cell because if an antibody, for example, let's say an antibody is staining for cytokeratin, if it's staining for cytokeratin. the rna in that cell also must be correspondingly increased otherwise you should not be able to detect that protein now if your antibody is not correctly manufactured what will happen is that you will get brown stain which is the correct description given by dr harshmohan sometime earlier because that's all it is it's a brown stain but that brown stain has to match with an increased rna if you are not getting an increased rna and you are getting a brown stain it means that your antibody is not validated you haven't produced a good antibody so the take home message in that and i'm very grateful to dr mohan for raising that is that don't be too sure when your antibody is staining everything brown please look into the antibody you are less likely to have trouble with an ivd antibody rather than a research use antibody but those problems could still occur yeah that's that's true thank you so much uh, and uh, i don't find any questions typed uh, in the chat section as well as in question answer sec uh, segment uh, i find a lot of compliments and congratulations and uh, you know the appreciation for the presentation for your content and uh, i'm not reading them out uh, there are about something like about 50 such um, people who have complimented you on your very nice presentation and we enjoyed it as much as uh, others uh, in the audience Uh, thank you very much sanjay for uh, having a wonderful talk um, uh, which was very very uh, illuminative uh, i pass on the proceedings to dr shanti the um, secretary of iapm for further proceedings uh, is there something in it yes, uh, yes sir it was very nice no i don't find it thank you sir, uh, actually also you sir in youtube also uh, many compliments are there for uh, dr sanjay nabani and uh, i am really grateful to him to for giving such a nice lecture 
and which will be really beneficial for the post graduation also as well as for us uh, i i i invite patra ma'am to stay this is my chance to also thank asrandi who is <laughs> uh, i'm sure all her students know how persistent yes, she is she is yes, here sir. every week she is after every speaker always <laughs> following up with the timelines i don't <laughs> think we could have a better person looking after us Oh, uh, Sanjay, I got one question towards the end from Dr. Ritu Kundu uh, from PGI. She writes, any experience on cocktail of antibodies on same slide with different chromogens? Yeah, so I don't routinely do those. Uh, the reason is that I'm, I'm more comfortable. It's only a question of preference. Mm -hmm. I think that cocktails are very good. They certainly enjoy great popularity in the market. you should use them if they work for you that setup has to work for you for example you are using it in prostate cancer you want a red stain highlighting this you want a brown stain highlighting that and you want all that information at one time and you are very happy processing it then it is the thing to do and the place to go i am not very happy with that arrangement i prefer to take my things one at a time okay so now i am checking for the basal cells they are there now i am checking for the marker okay it's there so if you have that kind of in inverted commas old man approach then antibody antibody cocktails may not work well for you but they are a good product if they work for you you should use them thank you patla ma'am please thank you dr navani for such a nice lecture thoroughly enjoyed all the points and the cases presented by you yes these are the problems faced by day to day and as you discuss and you mentioned the problems at the small level labs because always these uh, sellers they are uh, making a fool of us that yes this antibody was this new antibody has come and this is easier but every time we have to check at least at my place whenever they introduce some new or new uh, antibodies coming i ask them to send their representative let them come with the controls and show and show us the result that how results are coming how the we have to change the techniques so that is very important whenever we go for a new antibody or we change the supplier because everybody is claiming for their antibodies yes except for some standard uh, companies as you say like daco or any um, uh, other companies so but we have to see and we have to be very cautious whenever we see from the uh, new supplier or new uh, antibody from another laboratories so that is very important and again this was a very nice lecture very lucid and, and uh, i think not think i believe that all the uh, delegates who were there audience which were there the number of audience was much higher i think as i can see participants more than 113 were shown on uh, this website then many more were on the youtube so it was a good audience and i hope everybody has gained something from your lecture so once again thank you thank Madam, you so one, much one, one more question uh, from in chat box can professor hartman sir uh, answer ask that question one question is there na <laughs> yes yes this is let's weird. not let's not uh, disappoint no. the last questioner also somebody wants to know <laughs> the <laughs> not, only, not only the i'll be most happy to answer the <laughs> last question but yeah, towards the end uh, 